All right. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the, the heads up as we uh, have opened up the, the webinar and we're uh, now letting people sign in. And uh, we're gonna give it just a second or two as people start to, uh, to gather. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'll, I'll wait until we uh, get a critical number. <laughs> So as I mentioned before, this is a, this is a semi-virtual event for us. It's a little bit of a unique way of doing events. Um, we have a small audience uh, here in our uh, space at Mass Robotics. Um, the larger audience is, is through uh, GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar. Um, and uh, we're trying to juggle the two types of different platforms. Uh, always makes it fun. Um, but uh, this is our second one that we've done like this and it seems to have worked. How are we doing? All right, great. So um, as I said, good afternoon. My name is Tom Ryden. I'm the executive, uh, executive director of Mass Robotics. Um, so we're an independent nonprofit uh, that is organized to support the innovation ecosystem here in Massachusetts. Um, we focus on robotics, AI, connected smart devices type of things. Um, we aim to bring together startups, corporates, universities, different partners uh, to really encourage the interaction and growth of these companies. Um, this is our robotics and manufacturing event. Uh, this is one of our signature series, event, series events uh, where we dive into an industry that has particular challenges that robotics might be able to assist in. So this is our third of the year. We've done one in logistics and one in defense. Um, and then we'll have another one in, on construction after this coming up in November. I'd really like to thank Mass MEP for their collaboration on this event uh, during our this is our state's uh, manufacturing month. Um, I'd also like to thank the Arm Institute. Um, so we are members of the Arm Institute and active uh, in that organization. Um, and we're excited to have them join us today. Um, this is actually their membership week, meeting week. Um, and we are at the end of uh, day two of their meetings. Um, we've also had a booth at their event, um, which has been great. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. And we're gonna hear a little bit more about them in a second. Um, before I to turn it over to uh, Ira, who is the CEO of ARM, I just want to go through a little bit of logistics. Um, so some of our presenters are going to be showing video. Um, and to get the best viewing experience, it's best if you close your other applications that are on your computer. Uh, sometimes these videos will pop up behind your other applications. Um, also, all presentations are going to be available as handouts. There is a handout tab and go to webinar. If you look on the right hand side of your screen, um, you'll find a tab that has handouts um, and you can download any of the handouts that uh, uh, are provided by our speakers and you can uh, look at that information when you wish. Um, we'll also be monitoring the tab for questions. There's another tab that allows you to do that. Um, we have a ton of presentations today, so I'm not sure we're going to get to individual questions, um, but if we do, we'll try to answer them during the, the, the speaking period. If not, um, we'll get answers to those. Uh, questions out to you either directly or through a blog that we'll we'll post after this. So with that, I'd like to introduce Ira Moskowitz. Ira is the uh, CEO of the Arm Institute, which is based out of uh, Pittsburgh, um, and he's going to be talking today about uh, some of the trends that they see, the institute sees, um, in robotics and manufacturing. Ira, great to see you. Well, thanks, Tom. It's great to see you, and thanks for the uh, honor of joining you today. Um, and hello to my friends in Massachusetts and uh, also to our ARM members that uh, may have just joined us from our annual Mar ARM members meeting, as Tom just said, and we're very pleased to uh, end our day two at this point so our members could join this meeting. So um, let's go on to the next slide. So for those of you not familiar with the ARM Institute, um, this is one of the uh, 14 National Manufacturing Innovation Institutes. Uh, we are a public-private partnership that accelerates the adoption of transformative robots technologies. Um, and we have a very large and very diverse ecosystem of over 270 members. Um, and our mission is to make robotics and autonomy and artificial intelligence more accessible to U.S. manufacturers of all sizes. Um, but equally important, we train and empower the manufacturing workforce for automation. Um, and the purpose of this is to strengthen our nation's economy, our global competitiveness, 
uh, elevate our national security, and even more important recently, um, to improve our national resilience. And you can see some photographs of our, of our headquarters building there on the left inside and on the right. Uh, this is a converted steel mill that we don't occupy the entire 250, 65,000 square feet or so. We're up there in the upper right corner, co-located with uh, CMU and the local MEP Catalyst um, connection. Uh, next slide. So before I talk about what I think are the most important manufacturing um, trends for robotics, um, I'd like to set some context about the importance of the very topic that uh, you're here to talk about today. And I'm gonna call these assertions. Um, and uh, for those of you from Massachusetts, you could probably give this presentation for me. You've heard it, me do it many times. Um, but the first assertion that's important to understand about manufacturing robotics is that um, innovation and manufacturing are inextricably intertwined. Um, those of us have been in manufacturing for our professions know that uh, in many cases, the knowledge that we gain by doing manufacturing ourselves leads us to the next generation of innovations because we learn so much about the products when we manufacture it. So this nation invents some of the world's most impactful products, uh, but in the end, uh, if we just innovate and invent here, but ship our manufacturing offshore, we can lose our innovation leadership. So manufacturing is essential. Within manufacturing, something we call advanced manufacturing, sometimes industry 4.0 or factory of the future. Um, this within manufacturing is one of probably the most uh, important elements of the topic of manufacturing. And that's because in what we call advanced manufacturing, uh, we are able to make some of the world's most impactful products. Um, these are products like semiconductor chips and things like that that are essential for the future of our nation's economy. But what is advanced manufacturing? Um, if you think about advanced manufacturing and you think about the contrasts relative to say traditional manufacturing, in traditional manufacturing, you kind of know it when you see it, but if you walk into a traditional factory, you see a lot of manual operations, um, you see probably lower margin type products and you will see worker training uh, that is essentially workers being trained on the tools that they're manually loading by more experienced operators. If you walk into what we call advanced manufacturing, which I assert is the most essential type of manufacturing for our nation, what you find and see everywhere is robotics and autonomy and artificial intelligence. This is the key attribute of advanced manufacturing. Those items are the foundation of every advanced manufacturing facility activity today and probably into the future. And what you'll see are skilled workers that are trained in these topics of robotics and AI and automation is the most common training they've received. So my assertion here is that manufacturing is critical to our nation's success and our economy and our resilience. Advanced manufacturing is the most essential and important aspect of manufacturing and robotics is the key element and the key attribute of that very critical advanced manufacturing. So that's why it's so important to have this topic and to talk about it today. Next slide. So for those operating the slides, um, this is an animated slide. So I'll just say hit the next one and we'll go uh, one at a time as we build this slide. So I just have a few minutes. And so therefore I'm not gonna show a lot of fancy pictures or video, I'll just do some text here. But these are my top 10 uh, trends for manufacturing. And uh, I wanna include in that, make sure that includes uh, a supply chain, the entire supply chain of a manufacturing uh, operation concept. Um, and so you could make these five, you can make them seven, you can combine them in different ways, so just like 10. So I'll call them the top 10 and I've differentiated them as such. So um, yeah, I hit the next one. So number one um, of my top 10 um, is improved integration. So the issue here is that we need to see improvements in how we analyze and how we automate manual operations to integrate robotics. I think a lot of you have probably been in factories like I have, particularly smaller companies where you see a robot arm that's been acquired for good reason sitting in the corner, because it turns out it is a lot harder to integrate it into an existing process, particularly a manual one. So we're really gonna to need to see more integrators that are in this business and better tools for assessing readiness, for simulating the environment, for helping to alter the environment to take best advantage of the robot um, and to reconfigure processes sometimes with digital twins. Next, uh, next item. My number two is user-friendly human interfaces. So I think one of the trends we'll see is increasing 
um, digital twins, simulation, virtual reality, and other interfaces for programming and managing robots to make them much more frictionless and much more natural for human beings to program them in order to expand robotics throughout the factories. Uh, we'll see a lot more tablet computers and eventually um, probably smartphones and cell phones being used to operate and manage and program those computers. And I think this is an important trend, particularly for the next one, go ahead, which is safer human robot interaction. I'm gonna spend a little more time on this trend because I believe it's so fundamental to the expansion of robotics in our manufacturing operations. We will continue to need to see advances in that synchronized coordination between a human working next to a robot. Um, you know, I'm a musician and so I think of a factory like this large symphony orchestra full of robots and, and humans, and they all need to play that same symphony piece together at the same time. And so the robots have to be increasingly perceptive and adaptable to us humans not just what we do, but what we intend to do, you know, to be able to read human body language and emotions and facial expressions and social cues, all that nonverbal communications that make us complex things as humans. Um, a nice example I like that's very simple was given by Professor Hebert at CMU a couple of years ago at our, our members meeting. And he said, if there's a glass of water in front of a person, and by the way, that wouldn't be in a factory setting, hopefully, but if there was a glass of water, um, the robot has to know that that person's probably going to reach out and drink that glass of water. But it goes the other way as well. You know, humans need better information on what the robots are going to do. So my friend Taskin Padir, um, who is with us today, going to speak later, uh, gave a nice example of this on the fish project for seafood processing, where he told me that the operators were kind of anxious being next to a robot arm. And one of the ways he was working on to solve that problem was to put a monitor up above the human so the human could see what the robot was about to do and that, that would reduce their anxiety. Um, but we do need uh, robots to increasingly recognize our behavior and in fact help us prevent errors and even safety risks. risks. Kind of getting into Isaac Asimov territory, uh, but this will make robots much more functional in a factory. Um, I'll also lump into this category the entire um, sort of topic of wearable robots, robots that we put around us uh, in a factory to assist in strenuous or risky tasks and to avoid um, human safety issues. Let's go on to the next one. My number four is autonomy. Um, and uh, this is an increasingly critical project and one at ARM that we're continuing to get our arms around. Uh, World Robotics estimated that the logistical robot market, market will go from about $2.5 billion in 2017 to $22 billion by 2022. Now, this was pre-virus data, uh, but with so much, so much business now online because of the virus, it may still be on track. So we'll have this ever-increasing need for this absolute just-in-time supply chain um, that continue to drive improvements in autonomous guided vehicles and autonomous mobile robots. Um, we'll need better multi-robot coordination, computer vision, path management, uh, that whole spatio-temporal information concept to increase the ability of our AMRs to map their environment, understand what other humans and robots are doing in motion while they are in motion themselves, and decide and to some degree independently navigate through both planned and unplanned routes. Uh, next one. My number five, uh, bi-directional communication, multi-robot teaming. So just uh, very uh, uh, briefly, um, we expect to see uh, robots within factories that are working together as a team, and therefore we'll have a need for much more uh, advanced bi-directional communication, um, tri-directional and so on among these teams. Next one. So plug and play open sources, folks that are listening to this are very familiar with this. Um, and again, I think we'll continue to see very rapid and very intensive deployment uh, in order to get the highest ROI uh, with raw software, other advancers um, in the topic of interoperability. Um, and of course, this is highly correlated to most of the other trends I've talked about. Next one. An important topic is modularity. Um, so in order to have robots continue to expand in their usefulness, uh, we'll need to see some degree robot arms and structures uh, to be structured as modules that the users can actually disassemble and reassemble into different configurations to increase the utility as their manufacturing processes continue to evolve. Next one. 
this is something that I think many of you are currently working on that are at this meeting, the, the increasing need for adaptability um, and flexibility and reconfigurability um, in, uh, in robots and their end effectors, just making them more flexible and transferable to multiple applications. Again, manufacturing lines will continue to evolve more and more rapidly, and we need the ability for our arms and our end effectors to adapt as well. Um, in the end, we need to see our, our robots to have the ability to handle a wide array of different objects. Um, it will probably require the integration of a, of a whole suite of new sensors, uh, vision systems, materials, modeling, computational algorithms, and so on. Um, we really will see these end defectors approaching the sensitivity and the adaptability and the speed of a human hand. Next one. And I've saved this one almost for last. Um, we had a lot of discussions in the ARM member meeting today on this, um, and this is the whole topic of artificial intelligence. And as you can see, um, this is really an element of everything I've talked about previously. Robots that are more self-aware, self-adaptive, independent, can, can understand their environments, correctly make decisions situationally to help humans perform their tasks and identify unintended consequences and eventually train humans and perhaps train other robots. Um, uh, we had a talk uh, this morning, uh, our keynote talk um, by Al Shikani of A3, who quoted, I think it was Deloitte, saying that there is the potential of $5 billion in more value for manufacturing operations through the advancements in artificial intelligence and robots. So I think we'll see this continue to drive forward with respect to machine learning, distributed edge and cloud uh, computing, uh, planning and decision making. And the next one, and number 10. And this is kind of a new topic for all of us, I think in automation, uh, but the COVID-19 pandemic has really created a new imperative in this country for robotics and automation. We need now to leverage automated systems that can be more flexible in the face of a national crisis, like, like the pandemic. Um, our supply chains need to be more flexible and adaptable. They need to respond more suddenly to the needs of whatever the crisis is, ramp up more steeply, and very importantly, provide the, the immediate flexing capacity that otherwise is virtually impossible to provide. So I think this, the nation will see an increase in focus on deploying robotics to help us meet the next national challenge. So these are my top 10. They will be available for you um, in the handouts if you, if you want to continue to see them. You can mix and sort them. There's cause and effect in there. But again, I like the number 10. So I, I put them as 10 separate items. Next slide. So a vision for the future, people and robots working together to produce the world's most desired products and services and respond to our nation's greatest challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ira. Um, always great to hear from you and hear the latest. Um, and congratulations on your relatively new position out there at, uh, at ARM. Uh, and I know they're in good hands with your leadership. Um, one of the ways, let me talk a little bit about how we're gonna run today's event. Um, we are going to really, our goal is to mix, mix things up a little bit and, and get folks to interact. So we're going to get presentations from a number of uh, manufacturers uh, that uh, we know here in the area. Um, they're gonna talk a little bit about their challenges. Um, and then we're going to highlight some of the startups uh, that we're working with and some of the solutions they're working on Obviously, the idea here is to make connections and help uh, each side understand a little bit more of what's happening with the other with the other side. Um, so first up uh, is Giovanni from Vibram. I think a lot of you probably know Vibram. Um, if you look on the bottom of your hiking boots, there's this ni nice little yellow, uh, as you can see on the thing, uh, logo. That's a lot of them. Um, and so I think you, you've probably seen them. What you might not know is they make vast majority of the US Army issued shoes and boots um, and uh, the soles for those. And they're located just uh, just west of Worcester. So Giovanni, great to have you. Um, you're up. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, next, uh, next slide, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, I, I, we are Vibram. I, we are sharing also the presentation between myself, uh, I'm dealing with the operations and my colleague, Chris Nikopoulos, is dealing with quality. So we are 
probably the best guys to to present our our challenges uh, very quickly vibram is an italian company like you can uh, appreciate from my british accent um we i've been relocated here in the united states last since last year uh, to manage the operations and we have uh, like uh, it was already told um, focus on the military business here in the United States. So it, it, for us, the Northbrook Field facility, the Massachusetts facility is strategic to the benefit of, of our group and of course of the United States being probably the, the sole manufacturer of rubber soles in the United States. If we exclude um, a much smaller um, supplier of ours in, in uh, South Dakota. Um, our story is a very long story. We uh, date back from 1937, where Vitali Bramani, from where, where we, we got the name Vibra, established the company. They, he made a joint venture with Pirelli, uh, Leopoldo, the, the one, uh, the entrepreneur that built the giant in the tire manufacture and from there we have focused our business only and solely on the source rubber source our facility in massachusetts is manufacturing something like eight million pairs of soles a year and our biggest customer as i already said is the military and the Department of Defense. Uh, even if we are partnering with, I would say, most of the uh, most renowned brands all over the world in terms of manufacture. So you name uh, a name in the footwear business, probably he made with us some project or some, some shoe. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, in uh, North Bluefield, in particularly, uh, in particular, we are focusing the manufacture over to processes or to value streams. One is uh, related to the rubber manufacture, rubber soles. The second one over the rubber and the PU, uh, which is the um, probably our most value added business currently, even if. Uh, it uh, adds up to around 15% of the total operations of the facility. Um, and, but it is also the most complex process. And that is why, uh, like Chris will mention, this is uh, for us uh, one critical process we are focusing a lot of attention over and looking for opportunities to uh, make it more automated, to utilize concepts of artificial intelligence some of uh, i've seen some of the attendants today are also starting to collaborate with us in terms of future developments uh, and that's where we are looking forward to meeting uh, great great leaps in uh, uh, technology in advancement by using automation artificial intelligence and other tools at our disposal and uh, next please here are a, couple of, are a couple of examples of our technologies. Just a, a quick comment. This is focusing on the manufacturer of rubber. Uh, the, basically, the current concept of rubber manufacture dates back since the 1950s. So it's a very traditional, very consolidated process. This doesn't mean that there are not a lot of opportunities to make it run faster, more efficiently, with higher quality by adding specific automation or semi-automation to the concept. Um, the next one, please. And this is the PU manufacturer. Uh, you will see in the video how we are have arranged the process. It's a much tinier uh, process, uh, a lot more flow-like. Again, not a lot of innovation so far. Uh, the PU manufacturer again uh, dates back since uh, the 1960s 1970s but we are looking at great improvements in terms of the quality of the product itself so the polyurethane is leaping forward 
actually. And we have to adjust our technologies to new challenges in terms of lightness or performance and so on. So now uh, I hand over the presentation to my colleague, Chris. Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, next slide, please. Like they said, uh, my name is Chris Nicopoulos. I'm our Director of Quality. Uh, please pause the video just for a second. Um, thank you. So we recorded some videos of our factory to give examples of areas where we could use some assistance uh, in add adding automation to our processes. Uh, we have a very old factory and there are many areas where we've not updated with, our, with current technology. So you'll see in the video that we've broken the processes down into the two major product lines, like Giovanni said, polyurethane unit soles and rubber soles. So I'll go through each area and uh, very quickly in order to give you a basic understanding of our challenges, uh, some of which uh, we've already started to pursue with some partners that are here today, but um, I think that we're open to solutions for, for a lot of these processes as well. So um, if you'd please start the video, you can see that this first area is our polyurethane process, uh, PU mold release spraying. We have issues with consistently spraying the mold release uh, and the inconsistent application can cause sticking, that we're, which results in def uh, defects of our components. Uh, too much mold rele release can also cause aesthetic defects and contribute to bonding problems between the rubber and polyurethane. Next area is uh, our preheating of rubber. So you can see that you know, we have some issues with managing the rubber. Frequent loading and unloading causes issues with maintaining temperature within the oven, and that causes bonding issues. So managing the rubber in the oven and locating the rubber is very slow and inconsistent. PU trimming is the next area. So trimming defects are our number one cause uh, of bad soles in polyurethane. And operators learn the correct pressure, speed, rotation, and angle by developing muscle memory over time, which makes it so that there's only highly skilled operators uh, in these positions and it's very difficult to train new associates. A PU inspection is the last part of the process. All of our soles are inspected twice. And many of these products that even pass our, our standards are unnecessarily worked on. So we're looking at AI inspection to identify some of these bad parts um, and good parts and separate them, sending parts to either a packing station or a detailing step as necessary. Next, we'll see our rubber value stream. Uh, compounding is the first area. You can see that it's a very slow and tedious manual process with many opportunities for error. Um, and this creates variability from batch to batch of our compounds. Uh, there's also safety concerns for operators dealing with air, airborne powder contaminants um, that we'd like to reduce. So you can see how manual this is as he you know, sprinkles powder in and looks at the, uh, the readout until he gets the, the right amount of, uh, of powder in there, puts a little bit too much in, grabs some out. You know, very, very rudimentary process here. Um, next area that we're looking at is material handling. So transporting material from preforming uh, work center to a FIFO lane in the molding work center. Uh, AGVs could significantly reduce the continuous manual transport between work centers uh, in these areas. So you can see our floors aren't super level. It's an old factory. So there are challenges to certain types of uh, AGVs uh, working in these types of areas. The last area that we're looking at is molding. So in this area, preforms are loaded into the molds and soles are demolded. Uh, multiple defects can be caused by placement of the preforms and different components such as our labels. Uh, and presses are our bottleneck in our rubber value stream. So the aim is to improve our throughput by increasing the time the presses are closed and the rubber is curing while reducing the amount of defects that we have in the process. So this is just a few of our processes, you know, we have many more that we added to a list for this video, but to keep it as concise as possible, you know, uh, we wanted to, you know, just focus on a few and give you a brief, brief overview and idea, you know, of, of what we're, what we're going through. So um, next slide, please. I know there are a lot of, um, you know, startups and integrators and, and uh, different people here. So, if you feel like you know you could help us out in any way in any of these processes, you know, please feel free to reach out to us, uh, either Giovanni or myself, um, and we can discuss potential opportunities. Thank you.
Great, thank you very much, Giovanni and Chris. We appreciate it. Um, and great insight into some of the challenges you face in your operation. Uh, so next up, we have Gary uh, from Pelican. So uh, a lot of our robotics folks know Pelican because we use your cases all the time. Um, they're a national, multinational company that designs and manufactures portable lighting systems, temperature controlled packaging, and protective cases. Their products are used in many industries, including military, law enforcement, fire safety, and consumer entertainment. Um, they have a facility located in Western Mass, and Gary's going to be with us remotely. Hey, Gary. I think uh, I unmuted myself, Joyce. Thanks, everybody. Uh, my name is Gary Tavares. Tom, it was uh, Tom. You've been up to our facility, and Joyce. Um, I mean, I'll I'll welcome anybody to contact me at any time to arrange a plant through a uh, tour through our plant. We're pretty proud of it in South Deerfield. It's a nice ride out here. Um, again, thanks for for having me. Um, uh, again, my name is Gary Tavares. I'm the director of operations, manufacturing ops uh, for Pelican South Deerfield. So I'd like to, you know, take a, I'll, I'll get through this fairly quick. Um, if you have some questions, again, follow through the chat board or um, any follow-ups, I'll get you, um, Joyce can get my contact information. But I'd like to walk you through a little bit of, of South Deerfield and Pelican's history. Uh, follow that up with a little bit, share you some of our challenges and our business um, problems. And um, also, you know, what's our motivation for, for looking for some more innovation and automation particularly and i have three areas that are on my wish list not necessarily there are a couple i might um, talk about at the end but there's three specific areas we're targeting now um next slide please so pelican's really uh over 40 years old it's actually much older than that it's it's um it was originally founded the pelican brand by dave parker who was an avid scuba diver. So he was always looking for, you know, his inspiration was um, protective cases that were watertight. Uh, so that was on the West Coast uh, is where Pelican is actually founded and the headquarters are. Um, here on the East Coast, coincidentally, up in South Deerfield, a gentleman named Jim Hardig. So many of you on this call may know, uh, be aware of Hardig Industries. Um, and Jim, for similar reasons, looking for an opportunity to create protective um, packaging, you know, protect all that is important to you, um, had his business. And then we were actually competitors for, for many years until 2009 when um, Pelican bought out um, the assets of the Hardig Industries. So here we are, one big company in, uh, now in, uh, since 2009. Um, the operation up here in um, South Deerfield uh, is a little bit different than your, your Torrance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you can skip on that one too. Again, our, our, our vision is protect all that is um, valuable to the customer. In South Deerfield, our focus is 100% on protective cases. We do flashlights, we do coolers, which are also molded here, so that is another good part, but any drinkware, travel cases, backpacks, all the accessories are in um, our Torrance facility in, on the West Coast, just outside of Los Angeles. Um, next slide, please. If you haven't been up here, um, take a nice little ride. Uh, out west, up 91, it's probably 30 minutes north, South Deerfield, uh, stop at Yankee Candle, come visit us. We have a facility that where we have about 400 people, three shifts. Um, we operate large tonnage injection molding machines, um, anywhere from 1,250 tons to uh, 3,000 ton machines. Um, and we also have one of, if not the largest, rotational molding operations in the com com country. Uh, next slide. Our business is really broken up into two, almost two separate operations. One, as I had just previously said, was injection molding. Um, most everybody on this uh, webinar 
is familiar with injection molding. Um, what's different for us, very large cases. Uh, you've seen, you know, 30, 40 inch cases. We've got molds that are, you know, they go into 3,000 ton machines. So, you know, you're, you're talking about, uh, you know, multi-ton molds themselves. Very capital intensive, very expensive. We've got five of them that we run. Uh, and we run them pretty much 24-7. Uh, um, not seven, 24, six. We'd like to run seven, but we can't find people. That'll be the next one. Um, rotational molding is something I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with. A uh, very simple operation. Lots of your large cases and examples of containers or trash cans even are tend to be rotational molded. Um, you know, very simple molds. They're very inexpensive. The cycle times are very long. Um, so those are, uh, that's a weakness, um, but the simplicity of it is, is one of the strengths. Um, and we mold cases that are, uh, if you all been up here, we'll mold cases that we mold cases for the government um, that ship uh, helicopter blades. Uh, we've got cases that are, you know, six feet by six feet by six feet. Um, so some pretty massive cases. When I say cases, we're not talking about little you know, protective cases. We do some some pretty massive stuff. Uh, there's an image down at the bottom below on the right side of different sizes. Ones. We do a large variety. Uh, next slide, please. So what's our biggest challenge and what's our biggest motivation to start to pursue some automation opportunities? Um, I mean, I'll go down the bottom first and then work up. Uh, um, I was out talking with an operator just on Monday and asking them, hey, would it be helpful if I had a pick and place robot to help you out? And surprisingly, the response was, oh no, you're gonna eliminate my job. And I had to spend the next 10 minutes trying to explain that we're not eliminating your job. We can't find more people to do your job. So um, the shrinking manufacturing labor pool uh, in Massachusetts, and I think across the country, is really your number one incentive to start pursuing some automation. We just can't find um, the labor, and we're very labor intensive on uh, building our, our cases. Uh, we've got three different um, agencies right now and uh, numerous incentives just trying to get our uh, labor pool back up to um, to meet the demand. Um, kind of leads into to one of our biggest challenges. We're a little bit unique. We're more of a mass customization. We will produce or ship, could be 30,000 cases out of this facility a month. Now, that sounds like a lot of volume, but it, when you consider half of them, are, they're small runs, less than 100 pieces, less than 500 pieces, um, and even onesie twosies. We do a lot of very small, less than 10 unit production runs, um, very expensive, but they're very small. So when it comes to automation, it's really kind of difficult for us. I think Ira had one point, it's point number eight, I had to make a note of that, um, in terms of trends. For it to be attractive to someone like, uh, Pelican in this facility has to be adaptable, flexible, and very reconfigurable. Um, so those are those are kind of our, our constraints when we start looking to automation. Uh, next slide, a couple of um, opportunities for us. So our technical packaging, which is very small volumes, um, very custom package again for the military. Uh, everything that we make is has a drilled hole of some point, some size in it. Lots of these cases have 20, 30 different holes that are drilled manually right now for fastening. So some of these builds take, you know, anywhere 30 minutes to multiple hours to build a case. And drilling is, is part of the problems, part of the, uh, the process. So we haven't pursued it heavily, but we're looking for solutions to take cases as they're molded 
um, tie them up with a, a, a print and see if we can, uh, um, almost like a CNC operation, have something automatically drill a case. Um, again, you know, the difficulty will be the reconfigurings because not all cases are size. I might have to configure uh, 10 units and then change over to another 10 different units. You don't get very many long runs. So those out there that might have solutions, keep that in mind. Next slide. Um, I think Chris touched on this earlier, and this is something we've actually some of the uh, some of the folks that are on this this um, webinar again may have been up to this facility. We started having conversations about delivering point of use hardware for us. Every custom case that we have that's assembled, um, most of the hardware is is kitted. So it's pre-kitted once the case is molded. Um, out in our uh, shipping receiving operation, we kit all the hardware that needs to be um, together in order to you know, build the part. And then it's sent out to the assembly area. So we're sending out drivers. Uh, it does look like NASCAR. I mean, there are, are drivers all over the place just delivering kits on a regular basis. We'll deliver um, point of use material to uh, the assembly areas every two hours just to check and fill for rivets, for fasteners, washers, things like that. So, so we think that this might be a, an opportunity for us. In our facility, uh, I think we can do it. It's fairly flat. There's very, there are very few um, obstacles. Uh, so this will be a 2021 initiative to get something in-house and, and see if we can make it work. Anyway, um, next slide. I apologize for that. I picked the wrong room in the worst time of the day. They're mowing the lawn. Um, but anyway, uh, boxing, automated boxing, every one of our injection molding lines, currently it's manually um, configured for a package. It's manually the, the product is picked up and placed in the box. Then it's manually taped, manually put on the pallet. Um, but it's a repeatable operation. The configuration the size of the boxes may be different, but the process is the same. We have not really pursued this heavily, but uh, our new CEO has an appetite for these kind of automations. So going into 21, we'll be uh, looking for some help there. Um, that's the primary three that I have that are of interest to Pelican. There's something that I'm not sure if everybody else is looking at. We always look, usually look at the return on investment when you measure if it's a good um, opportunity or not. We're actually looking at things a little bit different. We do so many um, non-value added sub-assemblies, um, but if you look at the opportunity cost and really the value proposition, it's worth it to automate some of those small operations. It's much easier to, you know, more, makes more sense to take a valuable $20 an hour assembler and have him assemble a very expensive case instead of a $2 subpart. So those are the kind of things that we're looking at um, pursuing going into 2021. Um, and next slide, I think that's kind of a wrap. Um, the only one that uh, I know, Chris, you all were mentioning about inspection. And if anybody's interested and have the conversation, our number one quality issue is missing hardware. At the end of a build, if someone misses, uh, um, you know, some hardware, particularly on a cooler or a small cases, uh, we don't we don't have a, a process right now. But we're looking at high precision scales, Tom. That um, you can come out and look at it. We got one that we're trying to put in place that are very sensitive. That'll at least tell us if we're missing something when the case comes down the line. Great, thank you very much, Gary. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I have had the opportunity to to tour the Pelican factory. It was it was fascinating, um, and uh, I, I, he was very gracious to to show some of the challenges that they're looking to to tackle with automation. So next up, we have we'll hear from Ray Sup Supranat. I think I'm I'm gonna butcher your last name. Sorry about that. Um, Ray is actually here in person, so which is a is a lot of fun. Uh, Ray is the president of Davico Manufacturing. Davico is located in New Bedford, Massachusetts. 
uh, and specializes in exhaust manufacturing with direct fit and universal mufflers and pipes, carb legal converters, and hard to find direct fit catalytic converters. Thank you very much. Uh, so a little bit about our, our business. We've been uh, in New England, truly a New England story since uh, 1987, making uh, catalytic converters. Uh, so essentially we're a, uh, a uh, uh, large welding shop, uh, bending pipe. Uh, uh, we started out on the uh, making Subaru catalytic converters going back um, in our early days. And they were, uh, Subarus are very prominent here in New, uh, New England. So uh, as you see here, uh, we make 3,500 different uh, applications for every uh, year make and model vehicle. Uh, so that's part of our issue as well, is a lot of uh, short run, uh, high uh, variability in, a, in our runs. Um, we too are, are um, running into issues of finding people as we've grown, uh, both in skilled welders and then also as uh, uh, fabricators. Um, so that's been part of the uh, issues as we've uh, as as we've grown. Uh, you can see here our um, uh, facility. Uh, again, a lot of manual stations, uh, bending pipe, flaring uh, pipe, and then uh, you see uh, some of our 50 welding stations. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, uh, these are some of our processes we found in the last uh, couple of years that we've uh, automated some, and it's really kind of made us uh, more interested in seeing the uh, scope of being able to, to do it uh, 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 more as we go. So uh, again, we're cutting a lot of our own exhaust flanges and automated CNC. Uh, our bending machines are, are automated CNC. So it's really the connection um, between those uh, uh, things. We're delivering um, uh, some of our, our product uh, kidding, like some others have said, uh, that is you know a very manual process. We have ten people uh, in our building that are just moving uh, products around, uh, so that's that's somewhat of an issue for us. But as you can imagine, um, finding welders has been a um, a big issue uh, for us, and it's very specific to our our, our products. And so trying to train. Um, um, some of those guys has been, has been an issue. So, um, you know, through uh, Mass Robotics, uh, we'll uh, talk a little bit about the introductions we've had with scalable uh, robotics. We'll also be uh, talking while we're here on what we're trying to do to just fill that gap. Um, we have found that the more automation and more success we've had in the market, the more people we've been able to, to, to continue to hire. So that's kind of our philosophy on it. If we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this, this is a little more of our, our uh, kind of journey through automation. You'll see in some of our uh, next slide with our uh, products, we have a lot of round, uh, very simple welds. We've tried to take that out of the hands of our, our humans uh, just because, like I said, we have more work for them that's more um, uh, value adding. Um, so we are uh, working on some automation, um, but you know some of our, our future goals, in addition to what we're doing with, with Scalable, is, is automating our tube cutting process, delivering that to the tube benders, uh, as well as our, uh, our kitted products, delivering that to the people who are going to add value. If we could uh, go to the next slide. This is just a little bit about what we make. Uh, I think one more slide is our actual product. Uh, I didn't realize we had that animation, that's, that's great. So we make uh, some very simple products like uh, that you see there. And then um, we also make uh, some very involved uh, pipes that have multiple connections and uh, a lot of um, uh, bent tube that, um, that have to all fit together. And so again, with our variability, um, what we found in some of our automation is that um, our fabrication tolerances aren't as tight as they need to be um, for automated processes. So we're learning that stuff. And so that goes with that. Some of those themes we heard earlier about adaptability, uh, man, we've learned that the, uh, the, uh, the hard way. So, um, 
so it's a little bit about you know our product and, and what we do and if we could go to the next uh, slide and i know um, the guys from scalable are also going to talk but we're really excited about kind of the progress that we've made here in a very new um, uh, kind of uh, partnership with with scalable that we were put together with uh, through mass robotics uh, and this is really um, an, an additional uh, robot uh, that's going to scan our product and allowed us to bridge that gap with our our guys who are either good welders but not good robot programmers uh, where they scan the product with some uh, pretty simple teaching here with the pendant that you see uh, to, to really be able to expand our, uh, our, our capabilities uh, on it. So um, and some of our challenges are like, a, in addition to the variability is the uh, sheer weight and uh, bulk of some of our, our products. That's been uh, troubling for some uh, people looking to automate, but um, you know, it's a very industrial uh, hands-on product uh, process at this time. So, uh, like I said, the uh, moving of the product, uh, automating uh, some of the uh, cutting and joining that we're doing, and uh, also on the inventory side, if uh, uh, we, we think we can do some more stuff as far as automating the binning process and moving this uh, our products, uh, which really vary in shape and size um, to the shippers who are shipping it out. So. That's a little bit of our process, so we appreciate uh, the opportunity to to, uh, to be able to present, and hopefully at, uh, at some point we'll be able to talk more about uh, this welding process. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so obviously we're very excited that uh, that our startups uh, are engaged with some of the some of the companies here, um, and that's what we we obviously want to to encourage more of. Um, but I think it's just fascinating to learn also about some of the manufacturers, the challenges that they have, um, and how they're stepping into automation. Um, so next up is Rich Myers, Director of Operations for CheerPack North America. They are located in West Bridgewater, Mass. Uh, CheerPack is a provider of spouted flexible plastic, I'm sorry, flexible packaging and systems. The West Bridgewater site develops the laminated pouches, injection straws and caps, and ships product worldwide. Um, it is food grade, food grade production. Uh, it's a food grade production facility. Rich is going to share some of the progress that they've made with adding robots to um, and automation to the factory floor. So we've we've actually gone into really two primary areas. So we've done a lot of packaging off of our lines, and then delivering products. I know a lot of you guys are talking about delivering products from the warehouse to the floor warehouse to the floor so we've done a lot of projects around that we were fortunate to have our ERP company work with us so and help us develop software directly so that we actually don't have to do any of the interfacing they actually did a lot of the interfacing for us so we go to the next slide so as Tom said we produce injection molded caps fitments and we convert uh, film into pouches. We do many shapes, many sizes, many shapes. And then we put them all together and they get delivered to a food processing company where they'll actually fill the packaging. And we sell and service also the filling equipment that go into those factories. Next slide. So Chipac started in 2011, there was three of us and we decided to start manufacturing here in the United States. We had some partners in Italy and in Tokyo that helped form the company, along with the company in Plymouth, Mass. Now, so growing from three people to 325 people in a few years, it's come with a lot of challenges. And to continue to grow, we had a lot more challenges. You know, just finding good qualified people. We had a lot of absenteeism. It's a very high-paced environment that we have, we have a high expectation of people, and the quality demands are very strict inside of what we do. Because it's liquid packaging, and primarily we supply baby food packaging and kid snacks. So, and we do do some pet food and other things. So these are all things that parents find very important to themselves, so. And then we were also limited by people on the machines by how fast they can 
So, you know, in the skill set, and we produce a lot of parts. So in 2011, we didn't make anything, but now this year we'll do 900 million pouches. So to do that, we got to make basically 4 billion components in our facility to get to that number. So it's a lot of product and a lot of movement. So, um, and you know, with pay scales and with trying to find people and everything that's happening for what we do, it's very good. Next slide. So the first project we did was at the end of our converting lines where we actually transformed the film into different size pouches. We installed robots. And basically these robots were to replace the human beings that were taking the product from the end of the belt, putting it into totes. And they were also trying to inspect at the same time. So, and these things are coming off very quickly. The machine runs 500 parts a minute, each machine, and we have multiple machines. So there are a lot of challenges associated with that. So we installed a series of camera systems on the machines to basically check everything that the operators were checking. We also had the robots then take and place them into the totes, but also they were able to take the product off the belt and put it into inspection spots at different points during the operation. So, you know, before they operate, we were expecting operators to check at an interval. Now the robot would actually hand it off to the operator to inspect. So, and we were able to put people in higher paying positions. Um, so the expectation was that because we needed more people and we couldn't hire enough people that no one would really lose their job. They'd actually go from the lowest paying job in the facility. We would retrain them and get them into newer positions, which, we actually were successful in that in both these projects. We never eliminated a single job, but everybody got paid more when they moved to these new positions. So I think somebody was talking earlier about robots and the collaboration and people worrying about their jobs. We actually never had that. So we put it in place and people saw that it was never gonna replace them and that we were gonna retrain them. So it worked out pretty well for us. Uh, next, next slide. This kind of just shows you what the effect of it was. In 2015, we did everything manually. So everything coming off the lines was manual. We didn't even have the number of machines we have today. But we had 84 people. And we spent a ton of time on overtime with people working in the factory. In 2018, when we completed the project, we had only 35 people in, the, in that operation. And our piece parts per labor hour were over 13,000. Now we're up to over 15,000 on those same lines. And our quality defects went from 150 off that machine in 2015 to last year, only 15. So by having the robotics and the camera systems installed on the machines. So for us, they did it. They did exactly what we were hoping they would do and even more. Because the efficiencies and outputs, we were running 17, so, sorry, seven days a week and we were making around 15 million parts. And now we run five days a week and we make 21 million parts on the same number of machines. So it was very good for us. Next slide. Then we had a project that we started working on and this was, we used mirror robots and we bought the ones with the robotic cooks. So we would use all the carts that we already had inside of our system delivering rolls. Before we'd move them with humans, now we move them with and we were able to, our IT guy was very, had a good relationship with our ERP company. So the ERP company saw what we were doing and they actually asked if they could help develop some artificial intelligence to help deliver the product to the machines automatically. So now as we issue the material at our line, when they reach a certain quantity, we actually get a mission that gets sent automatically through the fleet software by our ERP system to actually go fetch the material from the warehouse and deliver it to the floor. So on our main products, on our the pouches and stuff, because they're all different brands and different um, makers, those are all done off that software. Some of our common components like pallets and fitments and boxes, they actually developed a simple interface so that we just have a couple of clicks and we can move automatically all the material from the warehouse right to our production lines. So for us, like I think somebody was talking about, we had a 
ton of people. We had 11 people per shift just moving material, five in the warehouse and six out on the production floor. Now we have two on the production floor and one in the warehouse. So for us, it was a huge labor savings. And they were people that we couldn't find. And I think that's the biggest issue that I think everybody has is just finding good qualified people, even at some of these basic jobs that don't require a lot of technology and a lot of skill. And going forward, we are, and so I'm open to anybody who's working on projects of so actually taking the product from the end of the line and delivering it to our automatic pallet wrapping systems that we have. So that interface is kind of our next phase into what we're looking at. And I think if you click on the link, you can actually see that um, the robot run. We didn't pay for this video, the ERP company, they actually sent in a professional company to kind of do this video. I know, so that's fun. So he's actually from the ERP company, so the ones that helped us do this interface, and put the application together that we're gonna do. That's our location and our IT guy and our engineer. And he's just talking about the labor savings and the cost savings that we're hoping to get. They actually also created a front page, right? In they have these what they call lobbies in our IFS system. So we can actually see the performance of the robots and whether they're active or not active um, real time. This is kind of just showing our process, our process in our manufacturing facility. So. And IFS Labs was already working on some of this development, but they really needed a real manufacturer that they could do this with. And so we've allowed their customers to come in and view our operations, to see some of the things that we've done. This is what the robot does. It basically goes down, collects the product. We can have different uh, carts and different ways of delivering because when that robot arrives, it actually scans that QR code that's on the cart and it knows what cart it's coming towards, whether it's a cart that's delivering the pouches, whether it's a cart that has the rolls on it, or whether it's one of the carts we had that's doing pallets and so forth. And it's all, it used to be that you had the magnetic tape on the floor, this is all done by GPS. So it's all done, you can do it from your phone, you can do it from a tablet. That's it. So, um, great. So, thank you very much for that. So, now we've uh, we've heard from our our manufacturers in the first half. We're going to take a short break, a uh, five minute break. I'm told from the back. Um, so, we'll get started at about ten past three. Um, so when we do uh, resume, um, we're going to now hear from a whole host of uh, startups doing different uh, applications. Um, they're going to be rapid pitches. They're all doing about a five-minute pitch, um, and so we're going to go quickly through them. Um, and then we're going to have a talk at the end about kind of the future direction for uh, direction of uh, robotics and manufacturing uh, from Northeastern University. So uh, five-minute pitch. We're at uh, we set to go. All right. We'll see you guys back in five minutes. Thank you.
test test I think we're getting back. Um, so it's great to see folks chatting um, within our space. Uh, that's a lot of fun uh, to see that even, even though we have a very small audience today. So welcome to the second half of our robots and manufacturing event. Uh, we're gonna kick this half off um, with uh, hearing from one of our partners, Mitsubishi Electric. Uh, Mitsubishi has been a great partner of ours for a number of years. Um, they are, uh, provide an amazing amount of support in many different areas. One is um, through some of the in-kind donations that they've provided for us. Um, so you're actually seeing a, a, a video of our uh, industrial automation lab, um, and you'll see one, two, three of the Mitsubishi robots here in the front. Um, we have some other vendors uh, equipment as well, um, but it's, it's great that they've been able to provide some of that equipment to us. 
So, um, as I said, uh, Mitsubishi will, will give us a little bit of talk about some of their automation uh, uh, equipment, and um, we're going to be hearing from the Senior Director at Mitsubishi Electric, Hideki, and he'll be speaking about the application of industrial and collaborative arms in manufacturing, the use case, and future needs. Hideki san Thank you for kind introduction. I highly appreciate Mass Robotics for inviting us to participate in this event. I'm Hideaki Minamide. I'm a center manager of North American Development Center in Mitsubishi Electric Automation. Today, I would like to talk about the application of industrial and collaborative arms in the manufacturing use case future needs. First, I would like to start with a quick overview about our company. Mitsubishi Electric was established in 1921 in Japan. It was the era of the Rolling Twenties. Next year will be our 100th year anniversary. Our business has five main sectors, industrial automation, energy and electric systems, information and communication systems, electronic devices, and home appliances. I belong to factory automation systems group in industrial automation systems. The industrial automation systems net sales is almost 30% of the company revenue. I will explain about factory automation in the next slide. Mitsubishi Electric provides a wide variety of FA products, PLC for production management, CNC, EDM, and laser cutting machines for material processing. We also provide robots and subsystems for product assembly. And we provide not only products, but also services like remote monitoring and data analytics, and so on. I will describe robots in manufacturing in the next slide. In a traditional manufacturing, in order to operate factory automation with robots, it was necessary to operate robots inside the pens, and dedicated production lines would be designed. Recently, safety technologies have been advanced with sophisticated solutions. By using these technologies, robots have been able to work with humans. And user interfaces have also evolved. Teaching has become much easier than previously. We call these robots collaborative robots. With collaborative robots, Manufacturers can realize partial automation with existing equipment by saving the initial cost of a robot engineer. In the next slide, I will compare industrial robots with collaborative robots. First, I'd like to talk about industrial robots. Industrial robots are good for productivity improvement. Industrial robots move quickly and precisely, so they are suitable for complicated applications, assembly or processing, etc. However, they need safety pens, and installation cost is expensive. Collaborative robots are a good option when new system design and equipment is needed. They do move more slowly, but are easy to use. So they are suitable for simple applications like picking up frames, kitting, etc. They do not need a safety fence and can apply with existing equipment. Installation cost is not expensive. In the next slide, I'd like to introduce our collaborative robot. 
we provide the collaborative robot called Assista. It has the following features. It complies with international ISO standards. It is an intrinsically safe design with interior cable insulation, rounded appearance, and position speed force limitation. The next slide shows more detailed features. Assistant supports three important features. First, easy control. All the user needs to do is move the robot to the desired position and press a button. A program is automatically generated and these programs can be edited too. Second, easy programming. Customers can edit the program intuitively on devices. Third, easy connecting. Customers can connect and affect us easily and setting is automatic. We keep improving these features for customer conveniences. At Mass Robotics, there are three Mitsubishi electric robots, one assistant and two industrial robots. Please try to use them. With Mitsubishi electric manufacturers, these easy to use robots, we are like the previous manufacturers you heard from today in that we are interested in the factory of the future and the innovative ways these robots will be used. We will be hearing from many of the mass robotics companies we have come to know and are working with as part of our Mitsubishi Electric Startup Engagement Program. We are learning from these start startups uh, how they will not only use our collaborative robot, but also about other robotics and AI technologies that we can apply in our factories. We look forward to connecting to learn from the mass robotics innovators and startups. Thank you to mass robotics for hosting this informative session. Thank you very much. Adaki-san, thank you very much. We appreciate it and always appreciate your support and partnership. Um, so next we're gonna hear from uh, a number of startups. Um, they each have five minutes. Um, so for any of you who've worked with Joyce, she, you know she keeps everything on, on time. So I'm gonna give you the five minutes um, and when, uh, when you're done, I'll come and, and, and give you the hook, so to speak. Um, so first up is Fringe AI, Chris. And Chris is here locally. All right, I, I don't have much time, so I'll just jump right into this. Um, my name is Chris Aiden. I am the founder and CEO of Fringe AI, and I'm uh, going to tell you a little bit about our company and what we're doing. Uh, next slide. So um, in 1974, Theodore Levitt said, people don't want to buy a quarter-inch drill, they want a quarter-inch hole. That's very much the reason that uh, we founded this company. Uh, our customers are not looking for a, uh, a kit and to build a team to solve inspection problems. They're actually looking for inspection solutions, and that's what we do. And so at the end of the day, our goal is to deliver to you a 10x improvement in operating expense and product yield. Next slide. So this is an application uh, that we've installed at uh, one of the largest uh, meat producers in, uh, in the world. Uh, what we're doing here is um, you're actually seeing the middle section of a, of a uh, well, it's called a pig, coming down the uh, conveyor. There are, uh, there are two real expensive cuts of meat there, the loin and the belly, loin and the bacon. And so what happens is there's a thing called the loin pole, which is this thing on the far right. Uh, what it does is it is going to separate the, uh, the belly from the loin. The precision of that cut can determine the uh, price per pound 
downstream. So what we did with, uh, with AI technology is we developed a way to find the shoulder bone, uh, use that as a reference to then uh, grade the fat cap, and then tell that loin pull machine precisely how to cut the meat. Okay, so uh, right now with this system, we've inspected over 2 million loins. Um, and uh, I, I can just say from experience that the plant manager and the cut side manager are very thrilled with the, uh, the, uh, the system. Next. So uh, I mentioned we, we provide a whole solution. I'm going to touch on the bits and pieces, then I'll summarize at the end. Um, this is the, an example of a dashboard that we, uh, we provide to our customers and that, in fact, we use. Uh, we have our AI systems that are reporting some of the telemetry data up to the cloud. And then we make that data, again, accessible to ourselves, accessible to our customers uh, through, through a web browser. So, so you have access to the, uh, the data remotely. In this case, what we're showing is actually, uh, once we started to measure these things, uh, our customer realized they have some problems upstream that now they're starting to focus on. Never knew they had the problem. Loins coming in backwards leads to the uh, uh, wear and tear on the machines. Again, a yield hit. Didn't know they had this problem until they, they were able to start looking at the data even though the, the real intent here is to, uh, is to track the performance of the inspection. Next. Same factory, in this case, we're, uh, we're grading a, or actually we're identifying the uh, left side or right side of the loin so that it can be sorted and then deboned downstream. In this case, we're using a three-dimensional sensor. Uh, we are agnostic to the sensor technology. We're agnostic to the hardware platforms. We provide the modeling services. We provide the runtime environment that runs across platform. And then we provide the uh, the support services so that we can update models and uh, and provide uh, notifications, alerts, and such that you know you can track the quality of your inspection. Next. So we don't just work in meat. Um, we're actually doing a demo of this system in our lab. If you guys are available and around, uh, this is for injection molded plastic. Again, we're using a 3D sensor. Uh, this is a electric part that's used in like a socket. So in this case, uh, we're looking for short shot. First thing we do with the boxes is we identify the features of interest, and then we look for short shot in those features. Uh, we don't do the automation systems. We communicate to those automation systems to reject the parts. Okay, so this one is our, gonna be our next production system. Again, um, the, the model is, is uh, something that uh, we were able to develop using a lot of the technology that's in open source in, in other places. So it's state-of-the-art technology. Next. Um, similarly, this is for uh, scientific glass. We're looking for scratches in chips. Uh, if you guys are familiar with computer vision, no chance rules-based approach is going to solve this problem. Next. And likewise, this is for uh, medical devices. Uh, this, this is uh, this and the other project, I'd say early stage, not as close to production, but what you can see is just the concept. If you can make the connection to your business uh, applications that we could solve, we, we want to we learn more about it. Next. And I've already mentioned basically what do we do? We've got this, this diagram, this is on our website, shows really an inspection system. We provide those three lower boxes, the modeling services so that you, we can deliver state-of-the-art tech, uh, the inspection gadget, which is a software platform, and then the services. And I think with that, uh, I'm out of time. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Chris. Next up is Realbotics, Chris Quick. Uh, Chris is remote today. Hello, I'm Chris with Realbotics Inc. Um, I will be talking about our Telerobotics uh, software platform. Next slide, please. Uh, we've got a, a software platform that allows you to remotely operate uh, devices and machines um, by connecting uh, equipment in your factory uh, with a human uh, located somewhere else. Um, we provide primarily this, the software, uh, but we do have a, a bit of hardware to make those, those last connections between our platform and, and your hardware. Next slide, please. Uh, we're targeting uh, manufacturing use cases, uh, things like industrial automation um, and troubleshooting systems. Um, as well as uh, training use cases and, and demonstrations. Um, so uh, it could be remote laboratories or product demonstrations. Uh, if you sell a product, especially uh, in today's uh, time with, with COVID, and you need a way to get that in front of customers, um, or you don't want to transfer uh, 
uh, mail it or, or move people around, you could use our system to give them a bit of a hands-on approach um, to, to experience that, that product. Next slide, please. Um, the unique benefits uh, of, of working with robotics um, is we can lower the cost uh, to entry of uh, traditional automation systems um, where you're spending a, a lot of upfront money on uh, software development and edge cases, uh, programming out um, uh, all those, uh, those issues that, that a typical automation system has, um, you're able to uh, get to work quicker um, because you have a human in the loop uh, just a, a message away um, that can uh, get involved with that system and hand control back over uh, to, to production or, or to that automated system. Um, we uh, provide remote access and control uh, to your technicians. Um, so if you have one or two specialized personnel that are able to uh, fix or um, uh, get back up and running your equipment, um, but those folks only work on first shift and, and equipment goes down in third shift, um, we could be a solution for you there. Um, because of that, we can decrease downtime and uh, help uh, remove or resolve stops, uh, errors, and some of those unknown edge cases that, that are bound to happen uh, with, with some of even the best automated systems. Um, and then finally, we, we open up the door to uh, some new automation opportunities um, because they don't have to be uh, 100% um, capable uh, from an automated standpoint uh, when you have uh, such quick turnaround on getting uh, your human folks involved. Next slide, please. Um, for that training use case, um, if you've got uh, multiple locations or you have staff that uh, you need to get uh, trained on equipment um, that you're today uh, uh, transporting people or equipment to different locations to get that hands-on um, uh, feel and, and training with your equipment, our system uh, could help you out. Um, this is great for uh, situations where there's a very specialized or scarce um, uh, equipment that there may be only one or two of. Um, like I mentioned, it removes those travel requirements. Um, we can also assist with some augmented reality. So uh, through our live video feed, we can then um, overlay uh, graphics that, that help explain and teach uh, what's going on with that system. Um, and, and of course, uh, we can provide access to uh, your equipment 24-7. Uh, Next slide, please. Uh, for the manufacturing use case, um, it's the new automation opportunities, um, uh, being able to tap into some of those uh, high mix and low volume uh, production uh, situations where there's uh, many edge cases, there's new products introduced uh, often to an automated system, and uh, that just starts to run up the, the cost on implementation uh, when you're trying to apply automation. Um, so if, if you have a human in a loop and you have a robust system that can allow uh, a human to remotely operate that equipment and get some of those fringe tasks done and then hand control back over uh, to automation or, or your AI, um, we might be able to help you. Um, this will provide that human in the loop. Um, and then additionally, uh, you can think bigger than your local geographical area for, uh, for talent and uh, support. Um, you're able to reach out to, uh, to folks that could be um, anywhere really with, with a, a decent broadband internet connection. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just about out of, out of time. I don't know if this uh, video will play. Um, so if, if we could just jump to the last slide, you can check that video on our website. And uh, we're looking for partnerships in manufacturing and training. Um, and uh, you can uh, find me at chris at realbotics.com. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. Uh, next up, we have Southie Autonomy and Raul, their CEO, and we're we'll talking here uh, locally. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Rahul Chivakati. Am I on? Please go back one slide, please. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Rahul Chivakati. I'm the CEO of Sathi Autonomy. And we make it easy for anyone to automate uh, manual tasks today. Uh, we want 
literally anyone on the factory floor to be able to repurpose a robot within 10 minutes and be able to do it with zero expertise whatsoever around robotics. That means no code and no programming. Next slide, please. So what we're focusing on are short run packaging tasks. So this is kitting, palletization, um, variety packs in the CPG space, uh, and cap display. Um, this could be contract packaging, this could be on the manufacturing side. These are basically uh, applications at the ends of the line, either feeding your production line or maybe at the end of your production line. Uh, and what we, what we help folks do is to scale their volume capacity regardless of how many people they have, right? So um, you can keep the same number of people, add robots, and you can now have a higher throughput without having to hire very expensive automation engineers or have someone have to babysit that robot. That person working the line can be the same person that's re repurposing the robot. This lets you maintain variability across your processes. You can be very flexible. You don't have to buy a robot for one process. You can buy a robot for 20 processes in that year and still get ROI, and that's the key. Right, you can use the latest and cutting edge technology without having to be, without having to be an expert in-house. Next slide, please. So what we do is we have a very, very easy gesture-based system where you just walk up to the robot. It's, we have basically what we call the wand, and you can uh, point to different objects in the environment and tell the system what you want it to do that day or, or for that hour, uh, let alone what you want it to do for that, that year. Right, we can um, have 2x the productivity gain. You have a steady 20 parts per minute. Uh, and you can increase your, your throughput without having to increase your labor cost. Next slide, please. So what comes with our solution is the robot, the wand, um, some extra hardware like uh, our augmented reality um, projector and 3D camera. This is all off-the-shelf hardware. Um, and then our proprietary AI AR software that really makes this super easy. And I'll show you a quick video um, to, to demonstrate that. Next slide, please. And maybe a little bit loud on the volume. So here's our augmented reality system. The robot can do packaging tasks like putting stuff in blister packs, right, in, in different configurations. So we can understand where the products are, what orientation they're in, and then what orientation they need to be packed into, all without writing a single line of code. Here's a quick example with, with what the wand looks like in a menu system. You can simply point at the system, say, hey, here, here's the blister pack is, and keep going. So again, our, our system is off-the-shelf hardware. We're, we're coming in, doing the integration and, and providing our proprietary software. But this is gonna make this easy. I'll give it one more second. I'll kind of get to the meat of the, the, meat of the, the demo here. So we have this demo live uh, in, in the back lab here. Uh, and this is a, a typical packaging task. This will either get um, pushed to, to a contract packager or sometimes manufacturers do this kind of stuff in-house. You'll see there's lots of different parts. The variations and, and presentation are not fixtured, right? So you could have any sort of variation of, of, of part presentation, that we call it. How do you bring the parts of the robot that you want? So you could be scattered on a table, singulated. It could be packed in a box. You can come on a conveyor. Um, we can handle all sorts of varieties of that. What we're basically just doing is telling the system where to look for the parts and then where to look for the blister pack. And then the, the system itself, our software, will figure out how to pick up the objects, reorient them in, in space without hitting anything, and then pack them in the right orientation into the, into the pack. So again, no code was written to do this, no visual programming, no dragging the, the wrist anywhere. Our system does all that for you. What you're doing is communicating what is the task that I wanna to do today and letting our software and robot system handle the rest of it. Um, happy to talk more about applications. Uh, kit kitting is one of our, our focus areas as well as uh, packing. Um, Please email me or reach out if you want to talk more about applications. Thank you. Thank you, Ru. Um, and um, for those of you who are here, as Ru mentioned, we, we'll be doing some demos. So if you wanted to stick around, we can, uh, in small groups, walk you through and, and see some of the equipment. Um, so next up is Ubrios. Uh, Anders will talk and he will be remotely. Anders, you're up. Hi, everyone. This is Ander uh, from Ubrios. I'm going to be talking about uh, our technology today when the slides kick off. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll see some nice stuff. So, uh, we built Gripper for Foods. So, and it's the most, most versatile hand on earth, we call it. But what, with one caveat, it's a robotic hand. So, next hit, please. Twice. So, here's the situation picking and packing is done mostly by human workers because of human dexterity. 
right? And you know it better than than I do. Uh, you've been living it as manufacturing companies out there, and human labor is expensive. We don't have many of that, and they're uninterested because this is absolutely not built for a human. Uh, these tasks uh, and those are actually built for robots. So those activities are mundane and repetitive. So in the next slide, I'm going to talk about our solution. Uh, and as opposed to many of the solutions that my friends over here at Mass Robotics talked about, uh, we are on the hardware side and we are basically bringing all those uh, video technology or all the, the software technology to the end with a very versatile hand. So we built this electrical soft gripper that is made with rubber fingers and um, uh, that is going to basically pick up any delicate object with no harm to it. But one other importance of that is not only it can uh, gently pick up objects that are delicate, it can also conform to the shape of many objects, regardless of their size uh, and shape. So it can conform. It is fully electrically actuated and it's very lightweight. Therefore, it is very, very affordable compared to the competition. And the next question you have is on the next slide. Do you need a soft gripper? So, you may or may not, and here you go. This is this is my help for you. If you have an operation where you can, you know, uh, see the uh, variables as object variation, precision, weight, fragility, surface finish, you can actually plot, or we can help you plot your operation in this graph, and then see which line it goes uh, uh, as closely with, so that you can pick the right gripper for your for your needs. And in many applications we are limiting the, the the main area of grippers to soft grippers, rigid grippers, and suction cups. And if you have high object variation and you don't need a lot of precision, if you are uh, picking up middle medium weight objects, if your objects are fragile uh, or your sur uh, surface finish is very low, in other words, the rough surfaces or the object is uh, complex in shape, then perhaps a soft gripper is, is the right choice for you uh, for flexibility and, um, and variation. So if you need a soft gripper, then okay, which soft gripper are you going to get? And on the next page, I'm going to show you a few options and uh, the decision criteria for you to actually think about. Uh, although I mentioned this is a gripper for foods, like I said, or in all those mentions, there are many other manufacturing items that are not food items, but can be fit in that previous graph. So when you look at cost uh, or gentleness or ability to handle delicate objects, simplicity, easy uh, uh, setup and adjustment and maintenance, uh, speed, high speed, if you need adaptability, in other words, if you want the gripper to be able to pick up a variety of objects, and if you want your gripper to be able to uh, be deployed on a various a set of robots, systems, uh, peripherals, then Eberos Gentle, uh, in other words, our gripper is the best choice. If you uh, keep hitting on the buttons, you're gonna see where our competitors on robot and soft robotics um, against our solutions. So from a cost perspective, we have uh, roughly half of the price. Uh, we are, these are all soft robotics, so they are all gentle. However, when it comes to simplicity, because our solution is electrical, just like on robots prefer, um, we are much better than uh, from a simplicity domain than, than any other pneumatic solutions. Uh, when it comes to speed, we can actually go up to really high speeds head-to-head uh, -head with pneumatic systems. From an adaptability perspective and other important pieces, our range of fingers or the finger range is very high. So you can actually pick up very small items as small as like five millimeters to as large as four inches uh, or uh, I should say 10 centimeters, 12 centimeters. Uh, in terms of deployability, we are uh, agnostic of robot brands plus electrical actuation only requires a simple uh, flying cable to be connected to a control box as opposed to needing pneumatic controllers, uh, compressors, valves, tubes, and many other peripherals that you're going to need in any other setup. So with that, if you would like to talk about your needs, your challenges, which I, I listened to in, a few, uh, in this call, such a great uh, conversation today, 
please, please uh, let me know. I will be happy to have a call with you, discuss your needs, and see if we can find the right solution for you. Uh, thanks, Tom and Joyce, for this great day. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry. Um, thanks for, for uh, your presentation. I love the slide comparing, you know, do you need a soft gripper? I thought that was great. Uh, so next up is Machine Metrics, Graham Immerman, uh, and he is remote today. Uh, Graham, it's all yours. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Graham Immerman. I'm the VP of Marketing for Machine Metrics. Um, next first slide, I guess, please. <laughs> So uh, a, a bit about us, Machine Metrics is the operating system for the autonomous factory. We've built an industrial IoT platform designed to accelerate factory digital transformation through plug and play manufacturing equipment connectivity, powerful analytics and intuitive apps for factory workers. Next slide, please. Uh, our customers are typically looking to begin or advance their industry 4.0 and digital factory initiatives related to their machine data collection and manufacturing analytics in order to improve their machine performance and productivity, increase their capacity utilization, ultimately win more business to remain globally competitive. Next slide, please. Right now, hundreds of manufacturers have connected thousands of machines to machine metrics platform across global factories and leveraging apps like machine monitoring, condition monitoring, of predictive maintenance, work instructions, building their own apps and more to optimize their shop floor productivity, increase their machine utilization and maximize their profitability. Next slide, which is a video and I'll now voice over it for you. So, not as well as my voiceover guy, I'm sure. Manufacturing does produce more data than any other major industry in the world. As we all know, it's been quite slow to adopt the digital mindset transforming industries like agriculture, banking, healthcare. We found that most shop floor transformation initiatives are just stifled by an inability to get usable data from the manufacturing equipment. Manual data collection is time consuming and inaccurate. Operating on gut instinct leads to inefficiencies and poor decision making that affect almost every component of the company's operations from significant downtime to production losses. In, given that it's the age of industry 4.0, manufacturers really do need every edge that they can get to stay competitive and real time data is that edge. Uh, your manufacturing equipment generates hundreds of, of data points every millisecond, all of which tell a unique story of what's happened in the past, what's happening now, and what will happen next. So we built machine metrics to empower manufacturers to harness this data and jumpstart their transformation initiatives. We provide an intuitive and flexible platform to collect data from any piece of manufacturing equipment and transform it into powerful apps for factory workers to help you reduce your downtime and maximize your profitability. What makes Machine Metrics so unique is our ease of use and time to value. Our IoT platform is easy to install and implement. You'll start visualizing your performance from anywhere, anytime in a matter of minutes or even hours. Universal plug and play edge connectivity harnesses and standardizes machine data across your entire fleet. Our intuitive out-of-the-box apps are easy to use and drive rapid improvements in efficiency. You know, very minimal training is required to get your, your, your people started using our apps almost immediately. Real-time shop floor dashboards, machine performance and condition monitoring, historical reporting, and automated alerts instantly enable visibility and analytics to help your team understand the big picture. Build your own apps, seamlessly connect or integrate your, your data with your current shop floor systems. Um, to integrate that data across your digital factory. Here's some of the things that our customers use the platform for, identifying production bottlenecks, updating cycle time standards in real time, detecting predictive maintenance and anomaly events before they cause downtime, uh, empowering uh, their workforce with step-by-step -step instructions, enabling remote monitoring lights out manufacturing with alarm notifications. With machine metrics, any manufacturer can start leveraging their machine data immediately to drive improvements and provide the foundation for scaling that data across their operations, while focusing on your resources, really on what you do best, which is making the best components and products in the world. Next slide, please. I urge you not to take my word for it. In fact, we like to let our customers do the talking for us. 
This is just one of our many customers that was able to achieve rapid and continuous value in our platform, increasing their OEE by 30% and their capacity utilization uh, by $4.5 million in just the first year using our, our platform on a subsect of their machines. And this is, uh, next slide, please. And this is really just the beginning. Once you're able to harness uh, the, the, oh, I'm sorry, I think the slide's out of order. Uh, could you go to the next slide? Sorry, we'll have to go back. Uh, this is really just the beginning. Once you're able to harness the machine data digital thread, opportunities to extend that data at, through automation are endless from driving internal maintenance and quality pro production design improvements and logistic systems, real-time data and analytics to automating supply chain for your materials, tooling and resources, receiving faster customer service with remote service and customized support from your machine and component providers to providing greater transparency and traceability into your production to your customers. Uh, back one slide, please. <laughs> Uh, I, I would urge you to remember that digital transformation does not happen overnight. It is a journey, and many manufacturers just starting to gain visibility into what's happening on their factory floor, while others are looking to predict what's going to happen next and automate autonomous solutions. So no matter where you are in your journey, Machine Metrics is here as your partner every step of the way. So check us out at machinemetrics.com. Thanks for having me, everyone. Graham, thank you very much. Uh, so next up is Raz Labs, Peter Vickers. Hi guys, um, we're unique here in this group of people. Oh, I don't like the mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, I'll use the mic. <laughs> um, we're unusual in this building. Uh, we are a resident of Mass Labs, but we're up on the fifth floor, uh, whereas this is the luxury section of Mass Robotics down here. Um, if we can go to the next slide. I want you to think and look at your fingertips. You know, these are possibly the most sensitive or one of the most sensitive components of your body. And in them is a nerve, multiple nerve, nerves that basically communicate back up into the neural system. And from that, as you reach out and touch, they look at that and they say, gee whiz, he's picking or he's touching the edge or he's slipping. Just think about it as a species, how we would have ever survived without fingertips. So let's go to the next slide. We've looked at this and we started off our journey talking to Taylor Farms out in California about the process of picking strawberries. And it was actually in this conversation that we suddenly penny drawn that that human hand is very, very key in the process of handling delicate fruit and not damaging it. That is true as we started to talk to other traditional gripper manufacturers, and we sort of looked at them and said, gee whiz, what are you doing out there? And some of them said, we're picking up very thin cardboard tubes, and in the process, we have a tendency to squish them. We're picking up glass files. We can't handle them. We were talking to Harry's razor blade company. They were talking about how do we pick up that razor blade and put it into the casing without damaging the razor blade. We were talking to a guy that is trying to actually use this product in creating boutiques, flower boutiques. How do you pick up the stem of a rose without crushing it when you are putting it into the bouquet? That's key, that's key. So our focus market is the traditional gripper manufacturer, not the soft guy, but the traditional guy. And we're gonna give him the tools to basically compete with the soft guy. So next slide, please. This is our sensor. We have developed the sensor based upon an electroactive 
polymer. This electroaptive polymer, we can manufacture in very, very different formats, whether it's hard or firm or squishy, but we can actually create a sense, sorry, we can create a family of sensors that could go on to very different applications based upon your need in your factory. This sensor is just like your fingertip. We can pick up 0 0.05 newtons with the sensor. That is basically the same feeling you have got with your fingertip. So just think about putting this on the end of a traditional gripper and giving that traditional gripper the capability of reaching out and touching just like you did when you reached out for your glass. We can go up to 20 newtons, but we've changed this world of touch and the capability of reaching out with a traditional gripper, just like you did with your fingertip. Next slide, please. Thank you very much indeed for being here. Please stay in touch because we'd like to talk to you. Thank you, Peter. And that is, uh, it's an amazing achievement in terms of adding that touch capability to it. To, and I think there's a ton of applications. So we got a little sneak peek of the next company coming up. Um, one of our manufacturers talked about some of the integration they're doing, but now we're going to hear from Scalable Robotics and Tom Fulberg. Tom. Thank you, Tom. First slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So Robotics hasn't really achieved the penetration in the in the industry in manufacturing that I really should have. And only about 10% of US companies that could benefit from robotic automation have done so so far. And that's according to the head of the Robotics Industry Association. And we think about why is that? It's not because of the capability or cost or you know reliability. It's really because they're hard to use. So next slide, please. A classic example is arc welding. Arc welding really needs more automation. You know, the characteristics of arc welding are that it's physically hard, it's, you know, kind of dangerous to your health, it pays well, um, it's a really well understood process. You know, we've been doing arc welding for like 100 years, right? Um, it's actually, when manually done, still pretty inefficient, you know, it's a 20 to 30 percent arc on time for the average user. And in the U.S., at least before COVID in Q1, there's about 300,000 open positions in the U.S. in arc welding, according to the American Welding Society. And then, you know, According to government statistics, there's about a half a million people that are injured doing arc welding every year, or half a million injuries. So next slide, please. So why hasn't it been automated? It seems like it'd be a, just the right thing for automation. And the real reason is that it's hard to automate. You have to be an expert both in the process and in programming. And that is pretty rare. So what do you do? You either you train your people up and you, you insource. And the issues with that are that you have to take them out of production, you have to pay the cost of training, you have turnover, you know, so you're constantly retraining, you know, and chasing that, or you go to external integrators, you outsource it. And the issue there is then then you're tied to the, the external guy's calendar and the cost of him coming in. And if you have to program a lot, then you know it's it can be really expensive. So what happens is that robotics tends to gravitate to things like automotive, where you're doing the same welds over and over again. You're making like a hundred thousand of a particular part. Next slide. So you could start the video. So Scale Robotics, we're the point and click solution for industrial robotics. And I'll show you what's going on. So first, our, our technology is applicable to more than just arc welding. It could be dispensing, it could be uh, machine, machining, it could be you know, other things like that. But arc welding is what we're gonna focus on first. And arc welding is used throughout manufacturing in many different industries. But as I described before, you know, it's it, there's not enough arc welders out there. The average arc welder is 55 years old, so they're kind of aging out of the workforce. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, there's a lot of injuries, and there's a, that problem with the, the efficiency of doing it manually. So you'd think that, you know, that robotics would really step into that, but here's one of the real issues. Every different robot manufacturer has their own programming language and their own way of approaching it. So 
you have to learn whatever flavor of robot you happen to have. And there's over 18 different manufacturers of arc folding robots. So with scalable solution, it's really pretty straightforward. What you do here is you place the parts in front of the robot, you tell the robot to scan the parts, and what it does is then it develops a 3D model of what's in front of it. So it's as built. You don't have any drawings, any CAD. You know, it's a brand new situation from the robot's perspective. It doesn't need to know anything. And then what you do is you, while the robot's watching, you basically just show the robot where the points should go. You can see in the interface there, those little dots that show up are where the weld should go. And then what the robot does is in the interface there, we validate it. So we show, you know, make sure that the robot can actually reach those positions. And then once it can, you know, it, it shows and in, in the interface can validate, then you're ready to weld. It'll go down and, and uh, touch off a couple of points to, you know, verify exactly where those parts are, and then it can weld. So next slide. So uh, just one more thing of our recent progress. So these are showing, and that's the that's Ray's robot actually showing on the top of there is the the scan and then the picture to the right is just us teaching it and then we can do the validation and weld and the whole process uh, from placing the part to welding is really only a few minutes now it's about it's, it's under five certainly depending on how you know active you are so that's it point and click for robotic welding thank you Thank you, Tom. Um, and as Tom mentioned, a lot of applications it was interesting because one of the manufacturers um, was talking about dispensing um, and uh, the challenges with dispensing and, and I think a great application. Uh, next up is Ascend Robotics, David Askey. David is here locally. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tom. And uh... And thank you, Tom. Or actually, what, what you just described for welding is a lot of what we do for uh, for coding. So, about Ascend Robotics focuses primarily on construction and manufacturing space. And I can tell you about a new a new product line. Uh, next slide. Um, but first, just where we come from. So our team is has a background in solving hard robotics problems, uh, largely for DARPA, NASA, and then similar entities. Um, shown here is a an autonomous uh, satellite for doing uh, in-space uh, repair of, uh, of aging satellites to be able to grab onto them, pull out components, and, and swap in. And on the right is a uh, the world's first autonomous oil rig. So uh, an oil rig with 18 robotic subsystems uh, all interacting autonomously uh, and um, very aware of their environment. So next slide, I'll go on to the... Um, so we're we do uh, precision precision autonomous coding with a primarily a mobile set of systems for uh, the lower uh, lower left showing one of our projects uh, a large new hospital system we do the do the interior painting for that the bot moves through the space um, learns the space um, doesn't does can take in a priori CAD or BIM information but largely acts like a a person or a painter that goes through the space has an understanding of what it's supposed to coat what it's supposed to avoid um, Ask, uh, ask a master painter for assistance if it gets confused or needs to learn. But as it goes through the through the space, uh, it learns and becomes more autonomous. Um, other the other areas, the manufacturing side, this tends to be large scale so far. So for for aircraft uh, maintenance and repair, and for uh, ship ship maintenance and repair, and the uh, actually the the square footage of paint on that ship uh, exceeds the the square footage in that whole hospital complex, uh, just for reference. Uh, next, please. So this is the way that the, the painting is currently typically done. Uh, it's people in hazmat suits, um, uh, often depending on where these sites are in some very hot climates. Uh, and this is not your everyday uh, interior paint. This is uh, toxic. Uh, this, this is uh, toxic. Toxic paint to to be around. It's very difficult to get out of and clean up uh, after, uh, even even with the hazmat suits. Uh, real issues with uh, with defects and these sort of scenarios. Uh, people sort of wave their hand around pretty well, and maybe for the first 30 minutes or so, they're they're not bad at avoiding drips or getting consistent coverage. But uh, over the course of an eight-hour day, it, it's not good. Um, the uh, 
the requirements for doing rework on these above 40%. Um, next. So a SENS approach is an autonomous painting system. Uh, we put it on, we have a range of mobile bases that we put the system on and we have modular, uh, modular long reach uh, arms for the painting. We can typically achieve about 2000 square feet per, per hour of painting. Uh, that's about three to four times faster than a manual crew. Um, but we deliver consistency of finish just unmatched. And then we've heard that from every everybody that we've uh, we've shown the system to and that we've, we've done work for. Um, the, the, a base system that we used here to actually paint the, the entry areas at, at Mass Robotics has a 10 foot reach. Uh, it's an extensible system. Uh, we've recently done jobs up to up to and above 60 feet reach with that. With the, um, but even though some of these spaces are big, we often have to get into the space through a rather small uh, small porthole or, or otherwise. So it's designed to be modular and fit through a uh, fit through a normal pedestrian door or or access port, um, and can be operated by a single technician who um, doesn't need to be a programmer and expert in the field. Basically. Uh, we say should be good at video games and uh, have some domain expertise, say in the, in the particular coding area. Uh, this keeps somebody feet on the ground away from the toxic materials. Um, I think we can skip past the, the video, I think the, uh, just in the interest of time, but please contact me afterwards if uh, you'd like to see some of the, the bots in action. Um, other areas where this gets, gets applied, so providing fire protection coatings, providing um, other other coatings for corrosion resistance, where where you need to get complete coverage of a of a surface, and you and the the mill thickness of, of, across the surface really matter. Um, feel free to contact me afterwards for more details about that. And then the, the last one, uh, and this is just a couple of sites from places where we applied the the robot for uh, construction space. One for for mass robotics for the the lobby right out here, and another one for the new headquarters of one of our general contractors. Um, and that's it. Please uh, contact me to learn more. Thank you, David. Um, so uh, let me see before. Oh, um, we did for anybody who's the, both the wall on the other side of this and then all through the kitchen was painted with, with David's robots. It was fun to see and watch. Um, and uh, really educational for uh, the painting crew that was here that was doing traditionally and saw that um, that the robot, as as David indicated, is faster. Um, I got to be careful because I don't want to annoy our uh, our painting contractors. We're still doing some construction work here, and hopefully we're going to be wrapping that up soon, and um, and then we we'll, won't be working with those guys anymore. I don't think. Um, next up is uh, hang on. Uh, oh, is Ava Robotics. Uh, Mauricio and Mauricio is remote today. Mauricio, you're up. Hey, Tom, how are you? Perfect. Uh, thanks very much, Tom and, and team, for inviting us to present today. Um, we're based uh, here in Cambridge, affiliated with Mass Robotics. Uh, where normally you would have an Ava to demo, but uh, for COVID-19, we had to move it to to a local hospital to to help out with some of the uh, um, some of the demand that they're seeing for for consultations. So, next slide, please. Um, based again, based in Cambridge, uh, we spun out of a robot two and a half years ago, uh, focused very much on building robots that can coexist with people and intelligent, intelligently move throughout a space. Uh, so you see uh, our first robot on the right here. Uh, it's a telepresence robot that allows people to remotely uh, be physically present, move around the space and collaborate uh, with people at a distance. Next slide, please. So the idea of collaborating at distance through a telepresence robot is allowing people who normally uh, could not make the trip, either because of distance, because of time, uh, or because they simply want to be in different locations uh, throughout the same day, uh, to be physically present and move around that space to collaborate for the work being done. We focus on applications from office environments uh, to labs, manufacturing, uh, even hotels uh, for conferences and events. Uh, next slide. The way Ava works uh, is the user logs in and you get an account. You can log in through your iPhone, your iPad, or your laptop. 
you just choose where you want to be. So the idea is, uh, let's say I can visit uh, Mass Robotics, uh, iRobot, or uh, Ava Robotics. I get presented with a list of sites, but I also get presented to points inside of the locations, such as the name of the conference rooms. Uh, in the case of a factory, it could be different steps along the production line. Uh, I simply choose that location and, and hit go. The AVA navigates the space by itself. So AVA knows the floor plan, it can navigate, avoid obstacles. Uh, and it, when it gets there, I'm presented with a session, which is a video conferencing experience powered by two-way video and audio using Cisco video conferencing. So very high definition, secure video conferencing trusted by IT. And I have the ability to look around, not just with a front camera, I have side cameras for my peripheral vision emulating what a human normally would have. So I can see who's around me and I can direct my attention to them. Uh, to ask for help. I can stand and sit. I can move around, of course, and I can zoom into obstacles. So it's a very interactive experience that allows me to be physically present as if I was there and move around the space. So I'm very empowered to move. At the end of the session, I simply hit N and the robot goes back to the charging station by itself. So I can go back to my family at the end of the day. I can go back to my work or log in and go to a different site. I don't have to drive that robot back. Uh, not really part of uh, uh, of what I want to do, driving robots around. I want to meet people, get my work done, share my expertise, uh, and move on. Next slide, please. In manufacturing, uh, there are several different use cases. Uh, some involve a remote expert consulting, helping troubleshoot a problem at the factory, helping the onboarding of a new uh, product to the production line, or simply get the production line up and running. We have applications around quality supervisors or or managers looking to do the work the way it's done, much like a gimbal walk, for example. So you can have someone who's remote, be physically present, do the gimbal walk and not have to travel to the site. So you can be much more productive and avoid the cost uh, and disruption of travel. A couple of customers I can reference in this space that use uh, Avon Manufacturing. Uh, one is JTEC, an auto parts supplier. They're part of the Toyota group. Another one, uh, Dura Automotive, also an automotive supplier. Uh, different applications each, uh, but the idea is always uh, fundamentally the same. There are people who are remote, they want to be locally, they want to collaborate or tour, visit that site, uh, and they can do it without disruption travel and being able to move around the space and being empowered to really see how things are done and not having a, a recorded video or someone with an iPad moving around that removes their ability to feel like they're there uh, and vice versa. The ability for people there to feel like they have someone really, really physically there helping them. Um, next slide. Thank you. Uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, Joyce and Tom know how to reach out to us. Uh, if you want to see a demonstration, uh, want to jump into a pilot program, uh, we have uh, many options to make it easy uh, to adopt Ava. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mauricio. Um, as, as you mentioned, we had one here, unfortunately <laughs> for us, um, but fortunately for them, um, it had to, I think went over to MGH or Brigham Women's and, and doing some, some work. Um, and I think COVID has really highlighted the value of telepresence and the ability mm -hmm. to do things more remotely. Uh, so next It'll up is Tulip, uh, Tulip, I'm sorry, Tulip, uh, Pablo Tosta will be speaking and he's remote. All right, can you hear me? All right, perfect. Next slide, please. So I, uh, my name is Pablo Tosta. I lead our uh, sales engineering function here at the at Tulip. And basically what we do is a platform to enable manufacturers to enhance their operation and basically bring visibility to everything that you do in your industrial operation, right? Um, so we know one of the first things is uh, that every operation is different, right? Uh, next slide, please. And if you take a look at um, current solutions that are out there, none of them has a have actually kept up with with the manufacturing challenge. Um, all of it is, uh, you know, everything is in Excel and Word, but none of it is actually delivering what uh, the capabilities and the challenges uh, that manufacturers face. Uh, next slide, please. 
So basically, this is you know this is kind of like the summary, right? Where what do we do? So we augment employee production, um, and we don't automate it away, right? So we adapt the platform to the process instead of adapting the process um, uh, to the platform. Next slide, please. Um, basically, this is uh, what I was mentioning before uh, around why we, you know, workers are being left behind in an agile world. So we provide that platform that's actually uh, agile, uh, reduces the time to value, and basically, um, you know, increases the, the, the way that you capture data from the floor. Uh, next slide, please. Turn this on. Yeah. So basically, uh, what the platform encompasses is basically a, a system of continuous improvement, right? So we have solutions that will provide, you know, digital work instructions, right? So that's digitizing the paper processes. Um, we also have uh, ways of replacing legacy software, right? to basically digitize and use a platform to capture data. At the same time, correlate that data with sensor and machine data, correct? And then also relying on system of records, right? So you have an application where you uh, collect data from different systems, systems, different machines, and then you, you kind of digitize those uh, paper-based processes, right? For example, a quality, uh, a quality sheet that needs data from uh, your MES, but also you're gathering data from an upstream process like a machine or a discrete, if you're in discrete manufacturing from a station, uh, for an assemb from an assembly street station. Um, if you can go next, please. So basically the platform has three major um, components, right? One is the operations app builder, which is basically where you develop the applications and then where you actually view the applications that you've developed. The other component is the system integration part and the IoT part. And the system integration um, includes uh, a, a very um, self-sufficient, uh, um, a very good uh, connector framework where you can actually um, get information from APIs or other types of uh, protocols that to communicate with Tulip. And the third component is basically the analytics uh, to help you enhance the information that you're gathering from your production system, and also do uh, you know real-time analytics to improve what you you know what we just talked about the continuous improvement cycle. Next slide, please. And basically, you know, we kind of um, take the three components and put it into this notion of build, deploy, collect, and analyze, right? Uh, without writing a line of code. So the other component that's really important at Tulip is that if you see on the left side uh, where you see the, the the little GIF, that's basically a snapshot of our um, app builder. And that app builder has no code that the user needs to write more than just you know select, drag and drop in the if logic of different triggers. Next slide, please. And if we talk about what are the types of solutions that we're providing, it, it goes back to what are the types of you know, apps or bundles of apps that we call app solutions that we provide as part of your you know, enhancing and augmenting that, um, the, the paper processes and what manufacturers are struggling with today, right? So it could be production visibility. Production visibility might mean that you need to actually have a manual operator terminal collecting data from the production floor. And that data could be um, gathering production metrics or gathering quality metrics as well. We can also have machine monitoring, right? And that's also part of what production visibility is, right? So if you want to have you know, a production line that has a machine and then an operator, we can deploy different apps in order to aggregate that data and deliver the best analytics for that continuous improvement process. Next slide, please. So how do you get started? Well, it, it's pretty easily easy. We have the app template and we also have IoT. Uh, next slide, please. And please get in touch with us. Uh, here's the email, sales at tulip.co. And we have a, a lot of resources on our website, tulip.co. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Joyce. Pablo, thank you, uh, appreciate that. And uh, 
uh, we have, um, I don't want to say our last uh, startup, but uh, um, we have uh, one more startup and then we're going to go to our, our future views. Um, our last startup, um, interesting enough, when I was watching the four presenters from the manufacturing side, um, they all had different challenges on their floor, but one of the things they had in common was the movement of goods. Um, and our last presenter uh, manufactures one of the, what we call AMRs, autonomous mobile robots. So we're excited to have uh, Tim McCabe from Waypoint Robotics. Tim, you're up. Thanks, Tom. So this is Tim McCabe. I'm here at, at Waypoint Robotics today up in Nashville, New Hampshire. Um, so you, you see our header slide there. We have a pretty bold statement at the bottom there saying we're doing for robotics what Apple did for MP3 players. And what we really we really mean there, that's really an aspirational statement where we're trying to um, uh, make robotics accessible to the workforce. We're trying to focus on ease of use and building an ecosystem that makes robots uh, like iPods became replacing MP3 players. Next slide. So we're, we're about a three-year-old startup. Um, we're privately funded. Uh, we, we shipped robots the, the very first year that, that we started up. We, we, uh, we engaged with a number of uh, top universities and research institutes uh, and also an OEM. And then uh, shortly after that, we released our Vector product, um, which was based off of a lot of that, that development. Our co-founders um, met each other at, at iRobot. Um, and we have a lot of um, technical personnel with experience from companies like uh, Segway and Harvest Automation. And, and my, my background is actually from Brooks PRI Automation in the semiconductor industry. Um, we're here in Nashua, right on the border with Mass. So we're close to Mass Robotics. And um, our, our products are really designed for manufacturing because we think that's really the most complex environment uh, for robotics. It's a, it's a dynamic environment. Uh, there may be small batch sizes, the missions may change very often. So we try to make our robots such that they're super easy to use and easy to ro reprogram at, at a moment's notice and, and, and apply them to a new mission. Next slide. So we, if you think about our ecosystem that we've built, uh, in the center here you see our vector AMR. So this is an omnidirectional robot. Uh, it can handle up to 600 pound capacity. Um, and we, we have uh, surrounding that for an ecosystem, we have our dispatcher software, um, which is our, our setup and programming software. And then we have our, our, uh, our whistle, uh, graphical user interface, which allows operators to very uh, simply interface with the robot. So you just like, just like they're using an elevator. Push a button, the robot comes to you, push another button, send it to a destination. And we have, um, faceless versions of that for interfacing to things like uh, conveyors and, and work cells as well for making integration very easy. And then finally, we have our automated charge system. So we want to make the, the robots be in charge of their own batteries to maintain their own batteries and, and maintain their battery charge levels. So we've developed actually a, a wireless uh, automated charge system, which, which provides very reliable charging. Next slide. And using the same ecosystem, we've, we've released the, the, the Mavic product, which handles 3,000 pounds. So you can see on this family of product slides, we have four different configurations of vector, ranging from 300 pound payload up to 600. Um, we have what we call the, 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 uh, the standard um, vector, and then the, the one with three dimensional perception, which gives us a lot more data for our, our nav stack. So the robot sees the world just as a person does. So this makes it very easy to program uh, for the robot to learn the environment, but also to coexist in a dynamic world because it will see the changes and it'll see the obstacles just as a person would. Uh, all these products are based on the same architecture, uh, our same waypoint embedded proprietary control system, which is really a key enabling technology, um, our, our three stage safety system, um, so they're all, if you know how to use one of these robots, you can use all of them. Next stage. Uh, our, our Waypoint Dispatcher software I mentioned earlier, it's, it's for, uh, for setup and programming. Uh, the professional level is actually resident on board the vehicle. So we don't actually need Wi-Fi or cloud to operate our, our robots. So we can operate in, 
and denied environments as well as you know real world environments where the Wi-Fi may not be uh, very good or it may be very spotty or, or sparse. Um, the, the tier two and tier three are actually software as a service that we, we employ those uh, when we're managing fleets of robots um, and th things like move tasks and, and, and scheduling. Next slide. So if you think about uh, how we've designed our robots for manufacturing, we're, we're really focused on um, ease of use for the existing workforce so they can own the robots and, and put them to work. Um, we have omnidirectional mobility in all, in all of our robots. Um, sorry. And, and um, that, that, that allows them to very quickly dock to a work cell. Uh, because we're omnidirectional, we needed superior navigation and we do that both with our embed system and our 3D perception. They're built for industrial environments. Floors aren't great, maybe they're uneven. And we have a number of integration options, including pre-engineered top modules. Next. So that, that, that kind of wraps it up. So uh, please contact us here. You can see I'm here in our, our headquarters. We're set up for doing uh, virtual demos. Uh, so we're adapting to the COVID environment. We have a number of robots here. Just come by and visit. And we can do all kinds of demos for you, right? And, and by the way, we also are, will be bringing a, a robot to Mass Robotics next week. So we'll be, we'll be able to host demos there as well. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Tim, and we're looking forward to that. Um, we are actually on a uh, an ARM grant to look at robotic disinfecting um, and installing a hydrogen peroxide-based disinfector on a robot and autonomously disinfecting. So that's kind of an exciting project. Um, so which leads into our, our, our final talk of the, of the day, um, and that is where do we go from here? So we've heard from a number of startups talking about what they are kind of in the midst of or, or have out there um, and, and are uh, hoping to, to grow. Um, but what's coming down the pipe? What, what do we see in the future? And so we're uh, very privileged to have uh, Professor Pradier, Tashkin Pradier from Northeastern University, uh, talk a little bit about that. So Tashkin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, <clears throat> well, the slides will, will come up. Um, again, um, I'm Tashkin Fader. I, um, I run an act, active research lab at Northeastern. But those of you who know me and, and my, my projects, we're always on the lookout. You know, we always go outside the lab and try to identify you know, use cases, use, um, user-defined uh, research, research problems. So uh, this talk, again, I, you know, um, I encourage you to take it by the grain and assault, and you know, I'll try to hit a few points. Um, and, and let's see where it goes. Next slide, please. Exactly a year ago, I presented at a digital transformation conference uh, somewhere in Europe, and I used this slide to motivate why you know we should be working on smart factories, why we should be um, you know we should be focusing more on robotics or all sorts um, to to achieve smart factories. And I said, look, you know, the unemployment is the lowest in 50 years in the U.S. Uh, we still have a ton of dangerous, distant, and daring jobs. Uh, there are challenges uh, day by day that comes with the immigrant label. And there is the increasing customer promise and or the expectations from the customers. Next slide, please. And then I put together this slide as of this morning. Uh, now there's a, there's a slightly different graphic, as we all know, as we are all familiar with. Now, on one end, we don't seem to have a labor shortage. However, there are workforce woes. You know, there, there, are, there are certain issues with the workforce that we have currently. Why? Because most of the individuals, unemployed um, um, citizens, don't have the skill set to, to perform some of the tasks that are on demand. Right? So on one hand, we have, it seems like we have a workforce ready to work, but then on the other hand, we still have a ton of jobs that are open that we cannot fill because of the gap in between the skills. We've seen unprecedented supply chain disruptions, right? And this is not this has not ended yet. You know, this is causing so many uh, issues in the in the quality in the products that we are manufacturing. Now, there's a technology shift for remote work. Um, you know, what happened was uh, we are hearing, and this is you know, I'm home today. Um, what happens is that, you know, talent um, or engineers who know how to fix a um, gadget in a manufacturing plant, they're staying home 
So the, the actual workers who need that expertise need to interface with technology and you know, seek help and so on and so forth if needed. There is still no you know, shortage of dangerous distant daring jobs. Um, actually, pretty much you can argue now that every job that's outside our comfort zone, outside our home or you know, our you know, offices or cubicles is a dangerous job uh, given, the, given the current situation. Customer promise took a very interesting uh, turn, in my opinion. It did not go away. Now we expect, we rely more on logistics, we rely more on um, e-commerce and so on and so forth. Next slide. So um, this project was mentioned uh, by our, Ira earlier today, um, and, and there are so many familiar uh, logos on this. You, know, you see Ascend Robotics, we heard from David Askey, Mass Robotics was part of it, uh, Harmonic Drive and Moog. Uh, this project was funded by Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Institute about two years ago, uh, as well as Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We looked at a unique um, industry, and we said, what will it take to envision the future of work? And what can we do uh, today? And seafood industry, um, uh, and then you heard about us, uh, you know, from some of the startups on, you know, food industry is a unique um, uh, industry that is that is so ripe for innovation. Um, and um, again, I don't want to cite the numbers. You know, there's there's so many um, uh, interesting statistics. If we can innovate in some of these challenging environments through technology, then perhaps you know that will scale up and down to to other industries. Uh, we looked at in this project specifically for inspection and grading of the products. So it was a very uh, specific use case, but then that helped us to um, to visualize the future. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, this should be a quick video. I I think I want to run it. So you know what we did was we envisioned collaborative robots that can work with a, with a worker. Uh, we definitely have shortage uh, or, or labor issues in seafood processing, and we also have um, huge volume that we cannot handle in the U.S. So you know we ship seafood. Uh, for processing and we buy it back. Um, so the idea here is, you know, how do you sort the big fish from the small fish? Because that's that's the one dollar difference between the price tag. But then how do we do this safely in in a human worker environment? And you know, when Ira mentioned, um, you know, one aspect in this human robot team in human robot collaboration, which is an important aspect, is not just you know understanding the human intent. You know, where is the human is reaching and so on and so forth. It's also informing the human worker with, a, with an idea about you know, what the robot is gonna do next so that the to whole team productivity is enhanced, right? So uh, if, the, if the robot becomes a distraction to the human worker, that's not good. Uh, actually, next slide. Um, we presented this project um, at an event uh, to, um, to Governor Baker. Uh, and again, you'll see a number of uh, familiar faces in this picture. Next slide, and actually next slide. Um, uh, we can skip the, the, the uh, so this was a, a you know, we can skip this, but again, I talked about it. We envision a true collaboration, a seamless collaboration between the human and the robot. You know, it's, it's beyond just being safe, beyond just being in present, uh, pre in, in, in presence in, in the same shared workspace. Uh, one of the activities that I took on when, um, when we went into um, the shutdown back in March, uh, was a, a small focus study. Um, actually, I got excited about this premise of, you know, future of um, smart factories. Um, what will it take to uh, to achieve smart factories? And I've done uh, very informed um, or, and, and focused interviews with a number of companies uh, from, um, without naming companies, uh, from chemical industry, from glass industry, aerospace, automotive, um, and, and so on. And my, you know, question set involved, you know, what are you doing today to achieve the smart factories or factory of the future or industry 4.0, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, what is your roadmap? Well, first of all, there is a language, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a zoo of terms that we use, right? I use a number of them already. Um, in general, what we mean is um, with, the, with the smart factory, the whole connectivity not only in the digital world, but also in the physical world, uh, the whole connectivity of systems from supply chains to the marketplace, right? There's a levels of transformation, right? So we cannot ignore, uh, you know, 2.0, 3.0 to achieve 4.0. Um, you know, 
if you take point, um, you know, level 0.5 to 1 as today's automation, industrial robots, very dedicated, you know, I don't want to repeat, uh, we all know, um, you know, what, what the current levels uh, or, or you know, what we have been working on for the past five, 50 years is, um, 2.0 is lean manufacturing, right? So how do you connect the supply chain? And it's mostly on the cloud, mostly on the, on the digital flow, data flow. How do we connect the uh, demand and supply and you know manufacture um, in a lean manner? 3.0 is when you start looking at, okay, we've been doing this process this way for the past 20 years. Now let's redesign using automation principles, right? So that's when you really uh, take the chance to take down a line and redesign and start from scratch. And then 4.0 is the you know grand vision of um, uh, lights out factories such as Tesla's Giga factories, you know, or the future of uh, Tesla's Giga factories, where you know as a customer we put the order in, we'll be able to customize and and monitor where the project uh, where, where the product is, and then everything is um, automated, manufactured autonomously, and then uh, ships out or or you know in the case of Tesla, the car drives to your garage. Um, what is the role of robotics? Right? So we, I kept asking, all right, so is it just data? Is it you know, in this digital transformation? Role of robotics is moving from just becoming an enabler for a few certain aspects for certain tasks. We are talking about more and more collaboration. We realize that, okay, so robots may not be ready for prime time. We need to have technology gaps and we need to be working on this. And it's great to see all the startups working on, you know, advanced sensing, advanced grippers and so on, then how do we move robotics to be a transformer in those design, you know, new processes to a, a self-robot, you know, I call a, the, the future of, um, a factory of the future, a, a, a robot itself. Um, just t tidbits in terms of what it is today and what's going on, uh, in most companies, these initiatives are, and, and I'm now looking at, again, based on my conversations with six to eight companies, most companies are doing this at the VP of innovation or VP of operations level. And we heard from, you know, Vibram, from uh, Pelican, that, you know, that, that's where the challenges are, and then they started looking at uh, what's next. Uh, needless to say, uh, for certain businesses, this requires significant levels of personnel capital and, and cash investments. Um, the variability and ver you know, variety of the products is, is an issue. You know, I, I put that also under the challenges and benefits. You know, for example, Airbus, the product itself makes it very difficult. You, know, you cannot just simply buy um, uh, you know, uh, our existing inventory of robots you know, will not be sufficient. You've got to redesign the whole structure to achieve it. Um, and again, implementation by function, right? So how do you go, um, uh, you know, what can what can be achieved in a year? What can be achieved in five years? And, you know, what's the ultimate goal? Um, factory of the future will require a paradigm change in operations. Uh, that's, that's for sure. You know, there are very few companies, in my opinion, today that is looking at the full premise of you know, robotics. So that's that's a good sign because, you know, that means, you know, as researchers, as startups, we still have a, 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 a long path ahead of us to work towards uh, realizing solutions. Um, the the um, challenges that I presented on our second, um, you know, in my in my uh, graph from today, actually those are the opportunities, right? So if we can address the uh, supply chain disruptions, if we can address the remote work uh, uh, Challenges. Those are the opportunities for for uh, technology intro, introduction of technology. Uh, I talked about the variability of products. You know, seafood is one, for example, right? Um, you know, textiles, fabrics is is another. Um, our new arm project is on uh, PPE manufacturing, and and again, we are just looking at uh, quality assurance processes to understand uh, what it will take. And we need to add this. You know, I'll tie it back at, at, to to where I started. We need to definitely address workforce challenges. We cannot just produce the technology and hope that this will be the solution. We need to train the workforce at the same time. And I think that's all I want to say. I'm happy to share uh, more details of this study um, 
uh, you know, and and you know, this is our uh, you know, this this one slide is you know uh, the handouts handouts are available. We took some of the principles and then we now put it together on a piece of paper. You know, what's the seafood industry 4.0? Uh, you know, in my opinion, we have another five years to achieve the full premise of this, you know, as, as we move forward. Thank you. This was a great event today. <clears throat> Very much, Tashkin. Um, so that concludes our event for today. Um, we are only about eight minutes over, which for us is amazing because we usually go, go much longer. Um, so uh, thank you for all for joining us. As I said, for those of you who are here and want to uh, get a tour and see some of the companies up close and personal, let me know. We'll, we'll do that afterwards. Um, and then I also wanted to let everybody know that our next signature event is uh, one on construction, robotics and construction. It is going to be held on November 12th. The setup will be very similar. We're working with a couple of the local construction companies here. Um, they're going to be talking about their challenges, and then we'll be having a number of startups talking about their latest developments. Um, we're in partnership with Autodesk on that event, so we're very pleased to have them as, uh, as one of our key partners, um, and we look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>